for panel four is innovation in institutions of higher education in Africa. And the chair of the panel is uh, Dr. Falu Ngom from Boston University. And he is joined by Mr. Alex Zito, also from uh, Boston University. Dr. Linda Davis from Wheelock College. And Mr. Zachary Gersten from Boston University. And we're going to start uh, with remarks by uh, the chair, Dr. Falu Ngom from Boston University. Uh, I'm very pleased. Uh, I'm very pleased to chair uh, the panel for and we uh, already have heard from uh, Dr. Davis, so I'm going to read the virus. Uh, but I would like to uh, introduce very quickly uh, Alex Zito and uh, what you call the Wolof, but uh, in real name is Zachary Gerson. Both of them are doing some interesting work uh, uh, in the whole field. I hope uh, that this time to be uh, useful in appreciating the new waves of innovation uh, in the of higher education in Africa and outside Africa. And again, I'd like to remind you, you have about five minutes for your remarks, and then we'll have a, a question and answer. Thank you. Yes, I guess I continue with, with a few observations and, and reflections emerging, as I indicated earlier, from my sabbatical leave last year, and reflecting specifically on my four months in Ghana, um, as I tried to draw lessons and comparative frames given my personal and professional knowledge of the Caribbean region. This time I begin as... Um, I did with the previous um, remarks on the panel earlier today, but this time focusing on internationalization as a lens. So I think I, it provides an interesting point of departure for reflecting, albeit briefly, on innovations in institutions of higher education in Africa. I think when one examines international programs and engagements mounted by institutions across the globe, fundamental questions come to the fore. How does one respond fundamentally, as um, indicated in a number of, uh, by a number of panelists? Um, how does one respond to challenges of access, of equity, diversity, given such a lofty goal as internationalization? Questions raised in earlier panels and other words focused um, in this instance on for whose benefit should higher education be internationalized? For what purpose? should higher education be internationalized? Why should internationalization be adopted as a major agenda for contemporary universities? Does internationalization matter to students and other stakeholders in host countries on the continent and the Caribbean? For what purposes should contemporary universities exist? And what university education should we believe in and commit within this internationalization Frame. Such questions, I believe, serve to underscore the fact that although admirable a goal of, the, that, of internationalization, the issues are evident and pressing and are conceivably quite different depending on the perspective from which you gaze. Indeed, as is argued in the literature, analysis of rationales for internationalization and innovation for more developed, quote unquote, countries as compared to emerging nations reveal very interesting patterns. And in the literature, we see a number of analyses which come to the fore. One, for example, um, highlighted by Kefira and Knight, um, based on the analysis of country reports of 11 African countries, which found that African countries look at internationalization primarily for the benefit it brings academically. More specifically, these researchers argue that internationalization is being promoted in these institutions to build human resource capacity to promote the improvement of academic quality. 
to strengthen research capacity and knowledge production. And one assumes that these African nations foreshadow challenges of other emerging nations, um, perhaps in a different um, way, in a differencing, different, differing, differing scales um, in the Caribbean region, for example. Um, but even if we conceive of um, the importance of such things as student mobility, the establishment of offshore campuses, access to academic programs of foreign universities, or engaging in joint research and development, the internationalization process still remains unequal. Uh, simply put, as has been said by various panelists, the um, colonial um, colonialism and neocolonialism still finds itself being manifested in many and various ways. The view from the other side, I believe, um, suggests that in weighing the balance and determining how one navigates the waters of internationalization, one must consider the centrality and the dynamics present and past of the context of post-colonial countries motivations and rationalizations for internationalization, roles played by leadership, uh, a point on which we've spent considerable time already this afternoon, including national and international actors, organizational policies, strategies, and structures at the institutional level, including funding sources and budget considerations, elements and expressions of internationalization, including a variety of activities some of which we've alluded to in the first panel this afternoon, study abroad, international faculty, and the like. I think the quality assurance question, which, is, which perhaps has, has been alluded to in, in our discussions this afternoon, should be um, brought to the fore at this point. Um, there's much to be analyzed with respect to the larger quality assur assurance question as it intersects with international education um, in, the emerging, in emerging nations. Uh, again, I, I um, cite Knight, who provides an excellent beginning point in such an analysis by posing a few fundamental questions aimed at a consideration of the various evaluation frameworks used by such agencies and issues related to the equity of access and the quality of relevance of the education provided questions that she poses pushes the researcher to delve deeper into the vexing historical context that continue to frame the very essence of institutions in emerging nations. How do emerging nations now deal with the increases in cross-border education, for example, by traditional higher education institutions and the new private commercial providers who are not normally a part of the nationally based quality assurance systems? Is there sufficient attention paid to national policy objectives and cultural orientations, for example? What of the accreditation and the degree mills that are able to place themselves out of the reach of national regulatory systems using nothing more than a web address? We've spoken a bit about decolonizing methodology, Professor Kamara. Um, and the nature of the organization of higher education institutions, I think it's an important point. Um, and I, this lesson was brought home to me so clearly through the rare experience that was afforded me as I worked with colleagues to mount and submit an application through the National Accreditation Board in Ghana. Indeed, despite the innovations that my host institution was intent on advancing, there appeared to be little space for such engagements resulting in extended debates throughout my tenure there. The question is, where is and why and on what terms are innovations to be born um, within the context of the continent? And so I end as I begin, I suppose, and as um, comments have, 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 have made reference, that indeed uh, there's pause, um, there's need for reflection, um, the themes that we highlight, um, the breaking of the vicious circle of dependency um, means finding solutions not necessarily from the outside but from within. Thank you.